Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Managing Editor, Associated Press, Michael Oreskes. Good. Uh, I spend uh, a great deal of my time on the shores of that other smaller ocean, the Atlantic. So it's a real pleasure and frankly a bit of a relief uh, to be here with all of you in the middle of the Pacific because frankly the mood is just so much better here. Uh, the, the PwC survey of all of you is striking for its overall optimism and sense of enormous opportunity uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, what a difference a decade makes, huh? Now the talk is all about European contagion, contagion, which doesn't rhyme nearly as well as Asian contagion, but sure shifts the weight of the future to the Pacific. Our subject is that future, and how the extraordinary changes in the world are redefining it. We're really lucky today to be uh, joined by a leader with one of the best vantage points for seeing the rapidly changing future of the Asia-Pacific region. So please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Hsien Long. Now, one brief word. Uh, the Prime Minister and I are going to chat for a moment, uh, but I do want you to know that um, the role of the moderator is really very special. I serve essentially the same role as a corpse at the funeral. Um, my job is to be a focus for the conversation, but if I say too much, it's going to upset a lot of people. So uh, you, this is an interactive session. The, uh, the organizers have made a great effort to make that happen. So I'm going to be keeping an eye out for the four uh, strategically placed staff members around the room who will have microphones, and we do want to involve you. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we're also going to bring two very distinguished business leaders up here to join in this conversation. But let me start, uh, Prime Minister, uh, by asking you, you once said that it's the duty of a leader to say that the world is changing and that we have to change with it. Could you begin briefly by describing what you see as the most important changes now underway in the Asia-Pacific region and how the business leaders in this room can best adapt to them? Well, the long-term change in Asia is the emergence of the new economies, China, India, uh, Southeast Asian countries, and the shift in the balance and the center of gravity from the west to the east, and how we are going to manage that change in a peaceful, constructive, uh, mutually beneficial way. I think that's the most important long-term trend for Asia and the world. But meanwhile, we are preoccupied, and I think for the time being rightly so, with problems off stage elsewhere, particularly in Europe. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a little more chance to talk about that, but since I have you alone up here on the stage, I, I want to take advantage of your deep experience um, in both strategic military affairs and economic affairs uh, to ask you a little bit about the overarching strategic situation uh, in Asia Pacific, and that obviously means the rise of China and the continuing question of the role of the United States in Asia. And, and let me start right here in Honolulu. Um, we're sitting uh, just a few miles from the U.S. Pacific Command, which you once described as the sheriff of Asia. No, I didn't uh, say that. Uh, but they I think keep, you included the Seventh they, Fleet in that. They, keep the, they help to keep the peace, and we welcome them. Uh, well, let me ask you a bit larger, though, more, more broadly about the American, the American role in Asia. The Obama administration has been working very hard, overtime really, to dispel the idea uh, that the United States is withdrawing from Asia. Uh, Secretary Panetta uh, made this tour of Asia recent, recently to reaffirm that even though the United States was going to be reducing military forces elsewhere in the world, uh, they would be, um, here we have some water here, if you um, that the United States was not going to reduce forces in Asia. And Secretary of Clinton, who will be here later this afternoon, uh, wrote actually a quite extraordinary article in Foreign Policy magazine under the title, uh, America's Pacific Century, by which she clearly meant the 21st century, not the 20th century. I just wanted to read a small passage and then get your response. Beyond our borders, people are also wondering about America's intentions, our willingness to remain engaged and to lead. In Asia, they ask whether we are really there to stay, whether we are likely to be distracted again by events elsewhere, whether we can make and keep credi credible economic and strategic commitments, and whether we can back those commitments with action. The answer is, we can and we will. 
Do you believe her? I think she fully intends that. I believe that America understands what a big stake it has in Asia, in China, but also in the other countries in the region. But you are a hyperpower. I mean, you have interests all over the world, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, and Asia is an important part of this world, but it's not the only part of this world. So uh, we have to share you with other preoccupations. Mm -hmm. But I hope that, I think with this administration, you've made a very big effort. And I'm sure as uh, time passes and Asia's weight grows, uh, I think our attention will be here. Mm -hmm. And say a few words about China. Uh, it's certainly a, a changed presence in, in, in Asia. It's a very rapidly developing society and economy, growing very fast now transforming very quickly. If you visit it, you'll find that it's a very uh, diverse, very vibrant society. Lots of things happening internally. It's far from monolithic and uh, 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 totalitarian, which might be your impression from outside. Uh, and I think it's a force of good for China and for the region that it is transforming in this way. Mm -hmm. You use the word totalitarian. Uh, I, I'm not sure most people would necessarily use that word, but a lot of people would use the word authoritarian to describe China. Well, the government is trying to keep control in a situation which is uh, inherently moving in many different directions. There's an enormous country, uh, different regions, different interests. Now they're rich and poor, the, the inland provinces and the coastal provinces, and they're trying to move it all uh, in a positive direction without things falling apart, and that's a tremendous challenge. I'm not sure that they've solved the problem or they have a, a formula for the long-term future, but uh, they're trying. Mm -hmm. And how do they integrate all of that, this internal challenge of China, with the pressure that the United States and other countries are putting on them, for example, to reform their currency management? I think their preoccupation will, in the first instance, be their domestic concerns, because if they lose control domestically of the domestic situation, they are in deep trouble. But at the same time, the external part is more and more important to them, the external trade, mm -hmm. their influence in the world, and their interest in other countries, and in particularly their interest in good relations with America. So uh, the currency is one of the issues you have with them. It's not something which can easily be discussed under the glare of spotlights because you can't move once people say boo to you. Uh, but offstage, uh, accommodations are being made mm -hmm. and can be made. The political pressures on both sides seem to be pulling away from accommodation, though. We heard George Romney just the other night at the Republican presidential Mitt debate. Romney. Uh, sorry, forgive me. Thank you. I'm still living in a past world. Uh, Mitt Romney uh, described China as a cheater. Uh, said they manipulated their currency and should be labeled as a currency manipulator. Uh, said that Obama wasn't strong enough on them. Well, candidates on the campaign trail tend to say strong things, and if they win, they tend to take more balanced positions. This happened to many previous presidents, <laughs> Republican and Democrat. I hope it happens again. Of course, while we're waiting for that, President Obama has his own re-election issue and uh, may have to make accommodations to the electorate himself in dealing with China. Well, what to do? Every country has its political pressures to accommodate, and that's one of the risks to the region. The potential is there that you have uh, an emergence of new uh, constructive powers. Uh, the balance shifts in a stable, even sort of way, and it's win-win. The risk is that there is a reaction, that the relationships turn sour, people respond to domestic forces, and then you do wrong things and lead to bad outcomes. It's happened before. We hope it doesn't happen again. The Chinese certainly are very aware of how the Japanese uh, came unstuck in the Pacific War. They've studied the Germans. They've studied the previous empires. Uh, they think they know they shouldn't go in that direction. Whether a new generation of uh, young uh, Chinese who have grown up in a stable, self-confident uh, country realize it quite as acutely and will be as careful and as restrained, uh, that, that's to be seen. Mm. Um, this is a good moment, I think, to, to pause. We're going to pick up this conversation. But I want to bring up to the stage um, two business leaders with uh, extensive experience in Asia and a broad view of the world. 
Uh, John Lechleiter, Dr. John Lechleiter is chairman, president, and CEO of Eli Lilly and Company, and Dennis Nally is chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers International. So, gentlemen, would you please come and join us on stage? Welcome. Dennis Nally, I want to I start, um, once you get settled in there, by asking you to spend um, a couple of minutes filling us in on the survey that PwC has done uh, on CEOs who do business here in the, trans in the Pacific region. Sure, I'd be happy to. And hopefully this will be a, some good context setting for the, the balance of the conversations that will take place here today and tomorrow throughout the course of the summit. Hopefully everyone has received a copy of this uh, uh, survey. It's, it's been at your uh, seats here this morning. I think it's a very comprehensive look at uh, how the CEO communities are really feeling about um, the prospects of uh, this uh, particular part of the world from a growth standpoint. Uh, we, uh, we interviewed, surveyed over 300 executives from across uh, the APEC countries, uh, which is a very um, exhaustive uh, survey in terms of trying to understand exactly how they're thinking about the future. Um, and I will tell you, uh, when you step back and you look at the overall findings, and I'll just hit a couple of those points here quickly this morning to get things teed up. First and, and foremost, when you ask the CEOs about what are the prospects for growth over the next uh, three to five years, they all cite the APEC countries as the principal drivers of their growth strategies. A very, very high percentage, well over 80% of the CEOs that participated in the survey look to this part of the world to really drive their growth strategies uh, over the next several years. Probably not a surprise, but nonetheless, I think, gives you a sense for how uh, the CEOs are thinking about uh, the future here uh, going forward. And interestingly, while a number actually cite China as one of the principal drivers of growth, there's also a lot of indications that the growth strategies are taking place in other parts of APAC as well, uh, whether it be Singapore, whether it be Thailand, Indonesia, uh, a number of other countries that uh, business is really looking for to really drive uh, their growth agenda here into the future. And I think that bodes very well for, for APAC and uh, what this conference is all about. Now, the second issue that we teed up was really trying to get a feel for uh, you know, what, what are the real concerns out there that are on the minds of the CEOs? Um, and we tried to get a sense for uh, the key issues that they're thinking about. Um, and, and one of the things I think we learned coming out of the, the most recent financial crisis was this whole question of whether or not the global economic environment was going to get disconnected, uh, whether or not uh, we were going to see a lot of... Uh, uh, pull back into very much a country-specific focus to deal with uh, the challenges coming out of the financial crisis. And quite frankly, when we pose this question to the CEOs, what we've really seen here is how interdependent and how connected these economies really are. In fact, when you ask what is the number one issue that is on the minds of the CEOs here in the APEC uh, region, it is the fact of uh, where is the U.S. recovery, we talked about that before, um, what is the potential impact on that, and the CEO uh, uh, that participated in the survey indicated that this was the... From 